So this is a primer for you as patients. So this is my impression of what your skin looks like. There's the top part of your skin, uh, which is the epidermis, uh, the horny layer, which is what flakes off uh, at the top. There's the dermis, which is the tissue part of the skin, and under that is the fat. And there is a junction between the epidermis and the dermis, and it looks like this under the microscope. Uh, you'll see slides like this, and if you think about it in three dimensions, I always describe it as the Allegheny Mountains. These are ridges, and in fact, each of these little bumps down here are called reedy ridges. Uh, and at the bottom of the reedy ridge um, are melanocytes. Is that all right? There they are, uh, uh, melanocytes. And this cartoon demonstrates the way I think of melanocytes. They have little fingers that reach out, little arms, and when you uh, hit uh, the sunlight, they start developing and producing pigment, and they deposit that pigment into your skin. And so that's how you tan. Uh, and depending on where in the skin it is, is the number of melanocytes that you might have. And actually, the melanocytes, depending on your color of skin, uh, is the same number of melanocytes. They just produce different amount of pigment. If you have red hair, you have a different pigment called eumelanin, uh, which is slightly different and gives you a red uh, U. Uh, with the exposure of sunlight, these melanocytes begin to change. So if you look at newborns, if you look at your grandchildren or you remember your children when they were born, they're born with no moles. And if you look at older people, we typically don't have a lot of moles. We have a lot of spots, but they're typically not moles. So moles develop over time. Uh, and they're constantly changing, and that's probably in relationship to exposure to sunlight. If you have more of the melanocytes at the junction and actually more of these reedy ridges, uh, that is called a freckle. And because the melanocytes haven't transformed into nevic cells, they still are able to deposit pigment, and so freckles will get darker in the summer and fade uh, in the winter. At some point, those cells will transform. They lose their fingers and they nest. And when they nest, they nest here at the junction, and that's called a mole. And so a mole is actually a benign tumor, uh, and they, they are right here at the junction, and anything, any of the pigment cells at the junction, if they're only at the junction, are flat on your skin. Over time, uh, those cells may migrate down into the dermis in a nest, and any of the melanocytes in the dermis cause a bump. So if the melanocytes are in your dermis, it's called a dermal mole. If they're at the junction, it's called a junctional mole. If they're both locations, it's called a compound nevus. Uh, and those can be identified by looking at your skin. So a, a junctional nevus is flat, and a compound nevus will have a flat and a bump on it. Okay. When those cells begin to transform into a cancer that's called melanoma, uh, and it forms here at the junction, and it will first spread usually in a radial growth phase, horizontal spread. And that horizontal spread is those cells have not yet transformed to be invasive. And so if they're only at the junction, we call that a melanoma in situ. And that cancer is not threatening to you. It's 100% curable if it's removed at that stage. It's when the melanocytes, the malignant melanocytes, begin to invade down into the dermis that they transform and they begin to have the ability to invade and ultimately metastasize and threaten our lives. That invasion was first identified back in the 1960s by a very famous pathologist by the name of Dr. Clark and he talked about levels. So if you look at your PATH report, you'll see sometimes a Clark level, named after Dr. Clark, uh, and he gave these levels one, two, three, four. They define different anatomy in the skin, and if the tumor invaded down into the fat, it would be called a level five. About a year or so after that, Dr. Breslow came along and said, you know, it's a little vague about how to define these anatomies in the skin, and why don't we just take a ruler and measure from the top of the skin, a place called the granular cell. It's the first cell uh, in, your, in your skin as a landmark and measure down in millimeters. And so those are called the Breslow depth, named after Dr. Breslow, uh, and they're measured in millimeters. 
So when you look at your pathology report of your primary tumor, you'll see a T stage. T stage stands for tumor size, and the tumor size are defined in this fashion. So the tumor size, if there's no invasion, there's no millimeters, and that's called a T0 melanoma in situ. Small melanomas are less than or equal to a millimeter in size. And then it age, there's a gradation upward, one to two, two to four, and four millimeters. A four millimeter tumor that's melanoma is actually a very large and a very dangerous tumor. A four millimeter colon cancer might be pretty innocuous. So the size of the tumors, different tumors have different definitions of tumor size. In melanoma, it's also important to look for ulceration. Dr. Bugner will probably talk a little bit about that. Uh, and it, ulceration also identifies a risk for metastases. So in your pathology report, you would see a P in front of the T stage standing for pathology, and then T1, T2, and then an A or a B, depending on whether your tumor was ulcerated or not ulcerated. Dr. Kane's going to talk to you about sentinel lymph nodes. Sentinel lymph nodes were first identified by a, a, a well-respected and regarded colleague of ours, Dr. Morton, who passed away a few years ago. He was a surgeon out in California. Uh, and he identified this technique of identifying which lymph node is draining your tumor. So my cartoon of this is demonstrated for you here. If your melanoma was on your back, uh, the surgeon would inject a radioactive dye into your skin at this location. The lymphatics in your skin are like the Mississippi River, so that all the lymphatics are going to begin to drain from that part of your body into a major lymphatic. The major lymphatic will then drain into a lymph node. And just like the Mississippi River, there may be a delta at the end of that river, so it may drain into maybe one lymph node or two or three lymph nodes in that site. Because those lymph nodes guard the lymphatic system, they're called sentinel. So that's where that term comes. And what Dr. Morton has identified is that the sentinel lymph node actually predicts very closely of whether your cancer has spread to the lymphatic system, through the lymphatic system to the lymph node. You have to also understand that how we evaluate things under the microscope has changed over time. So this is, uh, again, my diagram of how a lymph node is evaluated by the pathologist. And in the old days, uh, the pathologist would cut the lymph node in half and take a look at either half for, um, for melanoma. So if there was no melanoma in the lymph node, it would be appropriately diagnosed as negative. If there was a little melanoma here in the lymph node, the pathologist wouldn't see that because of the one cut. So that would be falsely defined as negative. If there was a lot of melanoma in the lymph node, they would identify that and that would be called positive. When your sentinel lymph node comes out, it's bread loafed. The pathologist actually cuts it many, many times and it goes through that. So this lymph node that was originally called negative becomes positive. Okay? So since there has been change in how we have managed the pathology side, there has been a drift of staging of patients. That's called stage migration. It's also referred to as the Will Rogers effect. So there are many people in the audience that may remember Will Rogers. He was a humanist uh, uh, and a humorist from Oklahoma. Uh, and he was very fond of saying that if 50% of the Okies move from Oklahoma to California, the IQ in both states would go up. Okay? <laughs> So that's called stage migration, okay? So what we're seeing is that as, as you look at the survival curves, that while we're diagnosing people at a higher stage, they're living longer, and that may not necessarily reflect any change in our treatment. It reflects a change in the way we categorize you. So the lymph nodes, again, are the N stage, N standing for lymph node. And there is no evidence of cancer in the lymph node, which is an N0. And then they're staged based on the, the number of lymph nodes that are involved and whether they're clinically palpable or seen on a scan or whether they're microscopic. So again, on your PATH report, you might see a C in front of the lymph node staging, which stands for clinical, meaning that you were not pathologically staged, 
or a P, which means that a lymph node was removed and looked at under the microscope, and the pathologist will tell us whether one or more of these lymph nodes are involved. Currently, the amount of melanoma in your lymph node is something that's very controversial, and we're trying to define whether, whether there is actually a subset of patients that have lymph node involvement, but that behave very indolently. That's still an ongoing area of research. To get, if you remember, to get from your tumor to the lymph nodes, you have to go along this lymphatic stream. And sometimes the melanoma cell might stop in the river and get out. And we see that as a bump between the primary and the draining lymph node site. Because it's in transit, meaning it's coming from the melanoma to the lymph node draining site, we call that in transit disease. And in transit disease is also scored as a, as a lymph node. Okay. So you'll sometimes we'll see in the path report whether there's in transit disease or what we call satellitosis, meaning that the tumor crawled out along the skin and is a little bit distant from the primary. So in understanding your path report, uh, this is really important to understand how we stage your tumor. And then the M stage stands for metastases or spread beyond the draining lymph node. And uh, there's either no evidence or evidence of, skin, of, of cancer, and the location of the cancer changes the prognosis. So if it's only in your skin or soft tissue, that's an M1. If it's in the lung, an M1A. If it's in the lung as well as in the skin or not, it's called an M1B. If it hits your visceral organs like your liver, uh, it's called an M1C. And then if it goes to your central nervous system, it's an M1D. We use a blood test that's called LDH, to also differentiate high risk and lower risk metastatic disease. So LDH is either elevated or not elevated, so that's a test that we typically do when you have metastatic disease. We don't use it for stage one, two, or three disease to define that. So once the cancer is removed, Dr. Puznov is going to talk to you about different therapies, and you have to understand how we now look at things. And what we've identified, not just in melanoma, but in many cancers, is that there is a receptor, a sort of uh, lock on the surface of your cancer, uh, and there's a key that gets into that lock, and that stimulates your cancer to grow. And depending on the cancer, it depends on the lock and the key, and each are a little different. Once the key gets into that lock, there's a domino effect of a number of proteins or enzymes in your cell that have to uh, fall to signal the cancer, the nucleus of the cell, to grow. This is called a driver pathway because it's driving the cancer to grow. There may be alternate pathways as well, but there's typically in many cancers a dominant pathway. And in melanoma, that dominant pathway goes by the name of MAPK. And that is a system that defines these proteins that are called RAS, RAF, MEK, and ERK. And what you need to know is that this protein, RAF, there's an A, a B, and a C RAF, but the B RAF sometimes is mutated or changed in your melanoma cell. That occurs in about 40% of patients. And if you have this mutation, it's called V600, so a protein, if you think of a protein as a string of pearls, and the first pearl is number one, and you can count to the end of the protein, 3,000 pearls, this 600 identifies the location in the protein where the mutation occurs. And if you have a mutation in this part of the protein, it is independently able to drive this system. So this is called a driver mutation. A lot of cancer cells have other driver mutations. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, gee, if we have this driver mutation, why don't we design a drug to block it? And that was an ongoing area of research for many years. Uh, we, f we identified some inhibitors that were not very good. They didn't work very well. But ultimately, a drug, a small molecule, was designed to block this, and it made a tremendous difference in the treatment of patients with this mutation in melanoma. So if one has this mutation, there are both BRAF, V600, 
targeted drugs. And since this has to stimulate MEK, there are MEK inhibitors as well. And so we typically give them as combinations, and Dr. Pusinov is going to talk to you more about that treatment. The flip side is that every cell in your body uh, has what I call mitts on their surface, different kinds of mitts. Those mitts are referred to as HLA molecules. And if you ever know someone that has an organ transplant, those organs are matched on those mitts. So everyone in this room has inherited half of those mitts from your mom and half of those mitts from your dad. The combination of those mitts makes you independently unique immunological, unless you have an identical twin. So this is what makes each of us unique to our immune system. Every protein in the cell, normal and abnormal proteins, are chopped up. And a little piece of the protein is then expressed in these mitts. Once they're expressed in these mitts, your immune system now can recognize it. So every one of us have packed ladies or packed men running around your body. They're called T cells. They can identify a protein in the mid. If there's a normal protein, your body very early in development has gotten rid of those T cells. So you're not supposed to have auto-reactive T cells. And if some of them are left behind, they're turned off. The immune system figures out how to turn them off. So your body doesn't recognize yourself in most cases, unless you have an autoimmune disease. In cancer, one of the hallmarks of cancer is mutated proteins. So the mutated protein is put in these mitts. And since the mutated protein is not you, you have T cells that can identify uh, the cancer. The T cell doesn't work because if the T cell was working, you wouldn't have cancer. It would destroy it before it even started. So there's something about the immune system that turns off these T cells. So a lot of my personal research and a lot of work over the last 30 or more years has been to try to figure out how to turn this T cell on. And you heard Sam earlier describe in her sister's case the role of IL-2 or interleukin-2 that was first identified as the T cell growth factor. It's a little bit more complicated as we're beginning to learn more about that molecule. And we used it to stimulate this T cell. We also used to use interferons to stimulate the T cells. So those are fuels. Those stimulate your T cells. And there are now many, many different fuels that we're in research with. And we've actually mutated some of these proteins to stimulate specific parts of the immune system. When these T cells get stimulated, they don't like to stay on. Because if your immune system stayed on all the time, you would have chronic inflammation, which is not good for your body. It spends a lot of energy, and it's not good. So evolutionary, these T cells turn off. And they actually turn off very quickly. So you get an infection. The body says, oh, we've taken care of that infection usually within a few days. And so they're immediately turning off. If they don't destroy the infection completely, you get a chronic infection chronic active hepatitis. It's evaded the immune system. Cancer evades the immune system. So these T cells are turned off. And for many years, we didn't know why they were turned off. But we have identified now the breaks. There are actually many breaks on the T cell. And two of the breaks were individuals that won Nobel Prizes uh, just two weeks ago for identifying a break called CTLA-4 and a break called PD-1. So these are the breaks. And you can make an antibody or a way to turn the break off, which turns your immune cell on. The first of which was a break to CTLA-4, which was called Yervoy or Ipilimumab, or what I refer to as Ipi. And that was commercialized and put into patients and uh, had a significant amount of success, had a significant amount of toxicity. The next agent that was developed was an anti-PD-1. The two of the first agents were called Opdivo and Keytruda, or Nivolumab and Pembrolizumab, or in my language, Nevo and Pembro. And they have also been commercialized. You see those on ads. And now they have generated very, very much excitement among across a whole lot of different tumors, including melanoma. And Dr. Pusinov is going to talk to you a bit about how these work and what the data shows.
So how do we approach a patient? So if you have an early stage disease, you have a choice of being watched or getting additional medical therapy. And when I talk to patients, you can be watched. You can be watched in two ways. You can be watched passively or you can be watched actively. Passively means you put your head in the, in the sand and you go home and you can call me if you have any problems. You case sera, sera and life will be okay. Or you can be actively watched. And actively watched means getting scans depending on your stage or a skin exam. If you've got a melanoma, you're at higher risk for getting a second melanoma. So looking at your skin, and you're at higher risk for getting other skin cancers. So looking at your skin is really important, and seeing a dermatologist for that reason is important. So as part of your lifelong surveillance is looking at your skin, avoiding, sun protect, avoiding the sun if you can, or using sun protection as appropriately. If you have a high enough risk for having the cancer spread, you might consider adjuvant therapy. Adjuvant therapy as standard of care has changed over the last few years. So in 1981, in the halls of uh, the basement at Yale University in the squash court, uh, Dr. Kirkwood and I sat there after a late night game talking about how we should try to treat patients and designed a treatment called high dose interferon. Some of you in the room may have received that. It's pretty toxic, it's given for a year, and it was the first agent that showed any benefit in preventing the cancer from coming back. And so that has been a mainstay of treatment for many years. It's gone through many different renditions and different analyses, uh, and it really stayed as a standard until the Yervoy, the ipilimumab, was evaluated uh, by Dr. Egermont in Europe and found that that drug prevented the cancer from coming back but it also had a lot of toxicity. Uh, so Yervoy became another standard in about 2014. Uh, so interferon was approved in 1996. So for two decades, it was the standard in 2014 or so. Yervoy became the standard in 2016. Nivolumab became the standard. And nivolumab is a lot safer to give a lot less toxicities, and that has become the standard adjuvant therapy for patients with high-risk disease. As you've heard, I've had three decades of trying to, re to develop better therapies, so I always ask patients whether they would consider participating in a research study, uh, and that's really important. Also, we now begin to look for that mutation in early-stage disease, because what was found is that if you have this mutation and you're at high risk, using those targeted therapies, those, those, the, the treatments that block the BRAP have also been uh, shown improvement in survival. So there are choices that we have depending on whether you're BRAF positive or negative. For advanced disease, this is the way I sort of think about things. You can have advanced disease and you can say, I'm 95 years old, I've had three heart attacks and life has been good and I don't want any more treatment. That doesn't mean we're not going to care for you. We would always want to provide you palliative care. But it's an active choice of making a decision to, that you do not want to be treated. Many of you in the room, uh, particularly survivors, made the other choice to take treatment. And so we would always give you treatment. We would always give you palliative care. Currently, we also now need to know whether you have that BRAF mutation. And then there is standard of care that Dr. Pusinov is going to talk to you more about. But there's always the research side of advancing your treatment uh, and advancing the care, not just for yourself, but for the next generation of patients. So with that, I'm going to end.